we begin with your childhood. Um, and I know you were born in New York. Is that where you were raised? Well, partially so. My parents are Israelis. My father was working for the Israeli Health Service, actually, a Kupat Cholim Klalit. And um, he was representing them in the US, in New York, when I uh, was born. Uh, age six or so, I moved to Israel. So I did all my education, you know, first grade till the end of high school in Israel. In Israel. Uh, before we get there, of course, that will be the center of our attention. Um, in the early years, um, well, really, the, the, the culture of your family in general, um, was it intellectual? Was it not so much that? Was it, did it have a scientific framework? Health can be a scientific or, uh, orientation or a social orientation. What, what was your father's right. culture? So my father came from um, from Poland uh, at the end of the war. So during the war, he was like in Russia and in Poland, and he was you know sort of a, um, a refugee. He was and my a survivor, in fact. And my uh, mother was um, uh, born in Israel in a okay. um, sort of farming community, what we call a moshav in Israel, uh, in agricultural uh, setting. A, and they marry, married like in 1948 and they went back to to Poland actually sort of to see uh, his mother uh, came out of the camps and then they brought her back to Israel. So that was a, a background, but the point is, to answer your question, yeah. is that he was, he, le he studied law uh, in so Poland before law. the war broke out. And when he um, came to Israel, he uh, essentially met the people who were putting together this um, unionized health um, or health insurance, which is countrywide health insurance, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a very animated person, very socially mm -hmm. uh, outgoing man, and very wise, and he made contacts very easily with people. So his connection to the health industry wasn't as a doctor or as a researcher, oh, yes. but he was an administrator. So when he came to the States, you know, he met lots of uh, young uh, Jewish doctors at the time to try and convince them to come to Israel, uh, raising uh, donations for this young country and for this young organization, and buying equipment and so forth. So there's like the first uh, open heart surgeon in Israel, Moïse Levy, that at the time he was in the States, he was working, I think, in Minnesota with uh, Bernard Levy, maybe, who, was, who did the first uh, open heart surgery, and he uh, was and one of the... And he recruited him. And he recruited him. And, and that have said that, so there were people who were significant in the um, health uh, scene yeah. in Israel that were sort of figures in, in our home life, because I heard about them because they were personal friends. So from that point of view, there was that whole connection to the health industry and um, to the wider world. But uh, they were not academic, not my father and not my mother. And, and your mother was not a professional? So my mother was, um, no, she took care of, of the house. She was an artist, really, in her soul. Uh -huh. So all the while, she, she loved to paint, she loved to write, you know, and after we left home, she did a lot more of that. She's left a lot of short stories and hmm. paintings and so forth. How, um, how many children in the family? We're three. Three, and you are where in the birth order? In the middle. <laughs> You're in the middle, okay. Yeah. Um, well, well, now I'll let you move to Israel, mm -hmm. six. Um, and this is where you're... Uh, but I remember my years in, uh, in New York, because we were born in New York, uh, very fondly. We, we went to the beach a lot. You know, it was, uh, we lived in, uh, um, near Colony Island. It's in a community called Seagate, and we would go to the ocean every day, really. So my images really are of going to the ocean. Well, in fact, you returned to the U.S., so it can't have been too terrible. I guess uh, not. I'm Certainly not in the family, uh, you know, legend. legend. Uh, well, we need to educate you now. Yes. Primary, secondary, uh, you're in Tel Aviv? In Tel Aviv, yes. At that time. Um, are there, is, is the Israeli education specialized? Are you tested and sent in a direction? Or not, 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 a, not the early education. So okay. when you get to high school, I think in my case it was in 10th grade. So it used to be that they would already specialize you in 5th grade. I mean in 9th grade, so I'm translating in, in, uh, in Israel, the 5th is actually the word uh, for, for, for freshmen sounds like five. But in any case, uh, that was 10th grade, uh, which is um, sophomore in high school. Uh, so you, that, you choose a specialization. But before that, you, you have a general education. Totally general primary education. education. Yeah. Um, are you beginning to uh, develop certain passions, intellectual passions? Uh, uh, are you a reader? Uh, 
who I, are you as a child? Right. So uh, I think the intellectual passion is actually to be a writer. Um, you know, I love to write. I love to read. Also, I was like, and I was always reading, always exchanging books in the library three times a day because you could, you had to only get one book at a time. So you had to go back and forth. So I, I remember my summers going to the library a few times, uh, and I wanted to be a writer. We had a little friend of mine and I decided we were going to do a little newspaper. Of course, there were like maybe one or two issues. I, I can't recall anymore, but that I would write the articles, and she would be the general manager. <laughs> and it cost uh, a cent or something. So you were the talent. Yes, but I don't think there was uh, a, a reader base. But in any <laughs> case, <laughs> our business sense was not very developed. In any case, uh, so that was really my aspirations, but I was good at math. I was good at math and I was good at sciences. And I was generally a good, a good student. I was a, a good kid. Were you, were you thinking of it as being easy, too easy, or challenging? Um... No, I don't think challenging, but I don't think necessarily a triviality. Um, I just was a, you know, I was a good student. I, uh, I you know, I, I enjoyed math in the sense that um, there's always the right answer, at least when you're in high school, it seems there's always the right answer, right? Because the kind of questions they give you yeah. have an answer. And um, it's That's not ambiguous. But I love physics actually even more, you know, the whole understanding sort of from, from sort of uh, axiomatic or first principles, how you get to a conclusion and trying to figure out sort of the model according to which you can answer a mm. problem. That, that, that I remember was actually exciting and appealing. Um, can I find a mentor in your secondary school my that secondary sends school? you in the right way? No, but I must say that my physics professor at the time, a professor, I mean teacher, yeah. and the math teacher, you know, they were kind of exciting figures in the sense that uh, they were good lecturers and you certainly, um, I, I learned a lot from them. It was it was exciting. Maybe it was also exciting to be good at these uh, at these professions because often um, maybe a little bit being a, a, a girl, you know, being really good at math and, and physics is, uh, you know, you feel especially uh, special. Was this considered unusual even in Israel at the time of a, a young girl, a girl, a young woman being good at these things? So you know. I think that here, I think that today, and maybe it's a United States thing, um, people are always sort of uh, on a lookout for talent. That's not the environment I grew up in. You know, you go to school, some kids choose a specialization of going to literature, some go to science, mm -hmm. some go to math. And I went to the science class, so the, these tracks that you choose yes. in 10th grade, the, it's called math physics, okay? And uh, there were few girls in there. There were a few. Yeah. You look around and there are boys. Mostly yeah, there, there are a few. I think maybe in our class there were four out of the totality, which might have been close to 40. Okay. Uh, and then there the, were two parallel classes, and the other one also had like another four. So that's much less. Yeah. Maybe so you're, not, you're not getting wrong counseling in the sense of your woman don't follow this career or anything? Well, like no. First of all, my family, certainly not. My father was extremely uh, clear and one might say even kind of pushy, that obviously, even though I love literature and all that, it is that I'm going to go into this math physics track. There's no question in his mind. Uh, okay. Totally. Okay. My mother, really, she was very much a humanist, right? So um, she she knew a lot of about history and sort of Jewish history, Bible. Bible, when you talk in the States, sounds like a religious thing, but in mm -hmm. Israel, we have a lot of um, we we study essentially from first grade to twelfth grade a topic called Bible, but it's sort of it's like a historical text. History. It's text, you know. Yes, you read this text in many different ways and lots of interpretations right. and historical context. Uh, so my mother was really interested in these topics, but before my father was very clear. But and I think that's very typical of a lot of um, uh, Israelis who came to Israel after World War Two. Ah, okay. Very pragmatic, you know. This is a way. This is where you go because this is concrete and leads to a career path or a job and and the rest of it is very nice but it's uh, speaking of going in, in German, or something yeah. uh, <laughs> not that I believe it but that's what he used to say okay yeah understood okay um, so now university there's probably no question that you go to university but um, maybe a question no of no no you, the whole setting is the following you were in high oh. school and Israel University happens after the army so nobody's talking about university at that point. Ah, okay. um, so you're just in high school and you've got matriculation exams and you choose sort of which exams you're going to take, you know, um, are they going to be like um, physics, they call it five points, sort of like the, the hardest or the or the not as hard. Um, 
exam. Uh, and then, you know, people talk about university later, but I specifically, my brother was in the States, and I had time before the army service, almost like a year, and my parents wanted me to go and study where he was to take advantage of that year. Everything is very pressing, not clear why, because life can, has a tendency of actually slowing down later. Yeah. But um, again, that might be the background that I came from. So, so I came to the States. He's there. You're going to go to the States yeah. for your first degree. Yes, I'm going to go to the States for a year. For only a year? But I stay for the first, for my degree. Okay, and did you go to go to a university? Or? Yeah, I went to Carnegie Mellon. How'd you pick it? My brother was there. I didn't pick it. was literally it. just... My brother was, uh, he did a math degree there and then he got an MBA. Okay. So, and your I just brother's there, mm -hmm. you follow him there. Turns out to be a pretty good accident um, because of your future career. But right. there you are. Um, what are you pursuing? Uh, you probably don't have to major yet your first year. No, you do. I'm, I'm pursuing math. I'm good at math. So he knows the math professors. He says, you know, my sister's coming. She's actually pretty good at math. Uh, they say, oh, why didn't she register? We're talking different times, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. So, I did. so you're in the math track, if that's the word. Applied math, yeah. Uh, and yeah. computer science, yeah. Um, is it in that university? Well, first of all, how do we get you from one year to a, a degree there? Well, right. how do you make that decision? So I, uh, I started studying, and um, I remember actually my first lecture in calculus. Uh, which was like, you know, the more advanced calculus because I had the prerequisites and I don't understand a word they're saying. And I'm uh, like, they, they use these words, multiply and add, and I know everything in Hebrew, right? And integrate and... Oh, and uh, it's, it's they're, a vocabulary they're, problem. I didn't realize that. So I come and I tell my brother, listen, I gotta go back to Israel. This is not doable. So he says, okay, let's look at the tech. Let's look at what you're supposed to do. And he says, this is derivative, this is integration, this is uh, multiplication. Right. I say, ah, okay. So then from the second lecture on, everything is very transparent because uh -huh. I know the, the basic lingo. In any case, but I liked it. I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed the classes. It was actually very interesting to learn. Yes. You know, I'm taking uh, math, I'm taking um, some graph theory, I'm taking some, uh, like an intro to pro programming class. I want to stay. So I apply for uh, the Pharaoh, for the army, right. and um, I finished my degree. And you, you received it. That, that was not difficult to get the... Eh, the it took Pharaoh. some time. So, so that we're not talking email time, right? You write a letter to the consul in Tel Aviv. The consul in Tel Aviv writes something to Israel, right. comes back. By the time they answer you, it's already past the date. That, you know, the whole thing takes about almost three years to end. And yeah. at that point, I finished my degree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you finished. Yeah. Um, you graduate. In mathematics? It's, uh, yeah, so in, in Carnegie Mellon at that time, there was not a computer science undergraduate major. They had these uh, special, you, you would be in applied math and you could sort of specialize uh, in computer science. Okay. So I decided to do that. You did? Okay. Yeah. Clearly an important point. So why? Um, that's a good question. I had a job in the computer science department as a programmer because I needed to support myself. Um, it's interesting. I take the course. I take a course on artificial intelligence from Raj Reddy. Uh -huh. uh, I find it very interesting, especially artificial intelligence. Uh, everything is quite fascinating. You know, compilers, programming languages, uh, discrete math. Uh, I wanna, I wanna study artificial intelligence. That's sort of clear to me. Maybe this is a temperamental question, yeah. but um, in the course of these interviews yeah. for Heidelberg. Um, of course, I've talked to mathematicians who stayed mathematicians, yeah. people who changed to uh, computer science, theoretical and more applied. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between the time when you are on a math track and when you begin to do computer science? What is the, is there a different kind of discipline involved, a different kind of aspiration? What, what's happening with that switch in terms of your intellectual direction? It's a very good question for adults. <laughs> you know, as a student, right, I'm, I'm 18 or 19, yes, yes, whatever. Yes. Um, it's not a time where everybody knows the computer science where it's at in the sense that there's a big industry and all that. It's just, um, it's, it's just interesting. It's interesting, you know, it's kind of, you know, the whole idea of artificial intelligence obviously is interesting. Uh, you know, how do you uh, make, write a program that generates text? I remember that I had a big project there of generating poetry you know, in an automatic way. Uh, I mean, compared to what they do today, it's probably totally childish. But at the time, like mm -hmm. the whole possibility of writing down sort of a, 
a linguistic uh, map of how um, language can be derived. It's fascinating. Uh, math, math is good, except uh, when you get to math in college, after math, uh, studying math in high school, it's very abstract, mm -hmm. right? It becomes much more abstract than how you do it, in, at least in Israel in high school, whereas that you just solve problems really according to set rules. Um, and, you know, there's this gap, there's this beautiful abstractions, and uh, then there is this uh, field which uh, seems to capture things about life, uh, like speaking and understanding. And um, I remember there was a project that I was working on on uh, a network of computers called CM Star, which is, I think, the first multiprocessor networks where there's a lot of computers mm -hmm. working together. And the project that I was given by um, Sproul, uh, anyway, the project was how to. Uh, it does implement a, 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 an algorithm that portrays three-dimensional objects where you don't see the lines. You know, like if you look at a box, you don't see the lines right, right. in the back. Yes, so it's, there's some algorithm called hidden line elimination algorithm. And the question was how to implement that on this multiprocessor system mm. where you had to take an image and break it down into pieces, give each different piece to a different computer. If a different computer would work on that piece, maybe recursively making it into small and smaller sub pieces. And then how do you incorporate it all together? It was, um, you know, it was challenging and beautiful. Mm. So back, going back to your question, um, I don't think you think about it in such an abstract mm -hmm. way. Mm. Do I like apply? Do I like theory? Mm. You just uh, get makes these decisions on a rolling basis, right? Which right. is probably the only way you should be making these decisions. I don't really believe in axiomatic <laughs> right. derivation for where your career and passion arrives to. On the other hand, there is in the university system, um, it's supposed to be guidance, there are people who talk to you about um, what you should do next, and you're not getting much of that. We're in 1979. Oh, oh no, 1976. Yeah. We're in 1976. Uh, there's no computer science undergraduate major there. Yes. So who's going to talk to me about it? There are courses. Uh, um, you go from course to course, you do well at them, then the professor um, notices you, maybe. Yeah. And then you get a job with some other, with Anita Hill at the time, who was in, the, in charge of the CM Star project. Um, and you decide you want to go to graduate school. It's not by consulting with anyone. It's not formally consulting, but trust me, I went a lot earlier than you, you know, and uh, and and to you got, university, uh -huh. and there was guidance, you're good in this, uh, maybe you should try this, maybe you should go to graduate school, maybe you shouldn't. I don't and, remember that. Okay. If it happened, it happened. I, do, I have no recollection of it. Actually, you were probably very lucky that there wasn't this because it was still a time when they might have said this was an inappropriate field for a woman in any case, but you're not getting it. So I don't think so because Anita Hill was a woman. She was the one who was in charge of uh, a lot of uh, the project that I was doing. There was uh, Ma Mary Shaw. There were women faculty at Carnegie Mellon, actually. Excellent. And very, and, 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 and sort of uh, figures of importance right. so they were getting, not they were not negligible in any way so you're not getting negative guidance certainly um, no I think if anything I must say uh, if I remember any comments yeah. uh, along this line it's um, no you know what I don't remember anything maybe from the teaching assistant something I think you would remember if it was determinate no it was so. not definitely not um, I would say that my, if I could say it overall, yes. um, that there probably is more negative comments to women, from my experience, you know, during my uh, time, yes. from our our peers than our mentors. Okay. So if I remember anything which is a little kind of patronizing, it's from a teaching assistant that I had in Carnegie Mellon. We were like three girls in a Fortran class, or yeah. and and, uh, and 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 maybe they were treated a little differently, but that might have been just a, a flirtatious thing, who knows? Yeah, yeah. This is just a recollection. I don't know if it's, uh, I can even well, remember quotes. It does not have to but be the thing about the peers the yes. is actually important mm. for graduate students even today. Okay. I think it's something that people don't pay attention to. They pay attention a lot to tell uh, professors how to behave and how to be supportive. I'm not sure they, there is a way to do it when it's your peers and it's people your age. But I think it's uh, probably where most of the stuff could come from. That's my experience. Okay. I mean, that's worth hearing if one mm -hmm. is going along this track. So um, I know 
right after you go to Rand? Or, or oh, yeah, so I decided to apply to graduate school. And uh, most, again, not because I talked to any professor, but because uh, I hear from some of the other students who are like well-to-do, uh, doing well in school, uh, that they're applying to graduate school. And then I, I'm told that you're supposed to take this exam, GRE. Yes. But it's like a day before. Or you can sign up in the last minute. And I never opened the book. I think to myself, well, I'm good at this. It's going to be fine. Wow. <laughs> I'm not going to say how much I got. But in any case, there's the GRE. I apply to some places. So I get into Berkeley and to, to Carnegie Mellon, actually. And um, I decided to take a summer job before. I decided to go to Carnegie Mellon, actually. And um, I take a summer job in California at Rand because Raj Reddy recommends me to someone at Rand. Okay. Which is again a, a happy circumstance. Yeah, I took a class with him, and, he, and you know I liked his class. And yes. So he recommends me, and I go to Rand, and I do a summer what do you do job there? there. What do you do? I know you're an intern, but who could remember? Oh, again, if it's not important to remember, I don't remember. Uh, you're at Rand. But I remember thinking, because yes. I was just registering for a master's. I remember thinking, I tell this to my kids too, that they're telling me what to do. Uh, I'm a programmer, you know, I do what they tell me to program, and I think to myself, why should they tell me what to do? I want to tell someone else, but obviously if you don't have a PhD, you can't direct the research, you can only execute it. Uh -huh. yeah. um, had you already gotten into Berkeley? Or? I did get it into Berkeley, but I decided to go to Carnegie Mellon. Um, I don't remember how this could be the case, uh, that, um, that I didn't tell Berkeley whether I'm coming or not, Potentially, I told both that I'm coming. I don't think so, but oh. possibly. Um, <laughs> a, a, I mean, I'm not going to rule that out. Okay. <laughs> Fair I think I really did tell Carnegie Mellon that I was coming. Who knows? In any case, I take a trip out the coast okay. with a friend from Carnegie Mellon who was working also in L.A. Rand is in L.A., yes. Santa Monica. And we drive up the coast. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. And we drive into Berkeley. We're like, you know, after driving for like seven, eight hours, awesome and it's beautiful. blue skies. You're driving, and you see the Campanile in the background. Yeah, yeah. There's all these green hills, and it's like, wow. I went to Berkeley, so I'm pleased. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true, right? It so is. then I let Carnegie Mellon know that I'm not going to come, and, and I decided I go to Berkeley. Uh, and had you gotten into both of the same kind of sounds, so, That sounds like my career path is very frivolous. Uh, and the but, Heidelberg but form is a very respectable form. <laughs> Okay. Somehow it all works out, so Be I think we forgive is. you. Okay. So uh, you decided to go to Berkeley. I decided uh, to go to Berkeley. And uh, now, again, maybe I'm asking a retrospect question rather than the way you would have looked at it at the time. Yeah. But what is the state, and it would be in computer science that you were. were yes, yes. Were in a, so, I want to do artificial intelligence. So what is the state of affairs at this point? Is Berkeley taking a particular interest as a school or as a discipline and computer science in particular directions, or where are we? Early 80s, right? Early 80s. Yeah. 80, no, 79, actually. 79. Yeah. So what is the culture of computer science at the at time? Berkeley? It's, a, it's too big a question, but if you can give me a flavor of it. Okay, so um, there are uh, these incredible... Uh, so first of all, I get there. I go there for a master's, right? Then I decide to stay for a PhD. Oh. So when I go for the master's, I take courses in. Uh, so artificial intelligence becomes pretty clearly, very quickly. that I'm not going to do that, just oh. because, I don't know why. But uh, um, I, I, I hit it off more with other faculty. At this point, there's no faculty that's assigned. The way they do it in Berkeley, there is, um, I don't remember if it was Sunday or Monday, it must have been Monday, that they have a seminar where three professors come, get up for 20 minutes each and they tell about their research. Oh. So I'm listening to these talks and, yes, yes. and based on that, I um, decide to go and do a master's with, with, uh, with Dave Patterson. And he's uh, and also because I needed actually money to pay the tuition, yes. and uh, <laughs> and um, there was a way somehow to work uh, to get some sort of job at Intel. I can't recall the details even very very, very clearly. So I do a masters with him on the Risk Project, and the masters is uh, writing some large program to collect uh, statistics for Pascal programming language, yes. how often different commands are being used because he is at that stage trying to optimize the instruction set sort of which instructions are being used often, and those are going to be the instructions that will be in some sense in hardware. That's what the reduced instruction set computer idea okay. was about. So I write this very large system, um, and that's my master's. But during that first year when I'm writing my master's and deciding that I actually want to go on for a PhD, so I do the exams for entering the right. PhD program, I 
meet all these theory students, okay? And uh, they're telling me, oh, that this Manuel Blum, he's great, and Dick Carp, and I should really go and talk to them. And um, so I go and I talk to Manuel Blum, and of course, we hit it off, and he, uh, he says, yeah, you want to work with me? Uh, you can work with me. And uh, we spent a summer trying to think of some problems, which is not what I end up working on. The next year, he teaches a course on computational number theory. So, course, I love it. It's clear to me that I found something that I really love. Yeah. Somehow this is extremely appealing to me. The entire class, solving those problems, you know, the whole idea of how to use probability theory uh, to design probabilistic algorithms. And then in the last few lectures, he talks about RSA and this merkel hellman crypto system uh, that was broken uh, shortly after, or already, after the, uh, shortly after they invented it. And it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. And he presents this problem at the end about there's Alice and Bob, and they want to flip a coin. How would they do it using some computational number theory ideas? He doesn't have a solution, it's just a question. And it's fascinating for me. So, you know, Silvio Picali is also taking this class, and I'm telling him, you know, this is really the problem. We should work on this, and, and we talk about some ideas, and... You, you... I, I like it. It's clear. That's really captivating for me. I want to work on this. So you, you touch the beginning of the rest of your life at this point. Absolutely, yeah. Um, this collaboration that emerges between the two of you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the general question about what is co collaboration like in the in the production of what turns out to be a very important yeah. uh, theory. Right. Um, you you both have the same kinds of minds, or you have no. different minds that <laughs> complement each other. I, we don't have the same kind of minds, uh, and I think that in, in general collaboration with people that have exactly the same kind of minds is sort of useless. Uh, it might be, f uh, no, it's sort of useless. So, uh, <laughs> um, we, uh, Sylvia is very, um, you know, he's very axiomatic, he's very uh, abstract, and I think I'm much more intuitive, you know, I, in that case, I, I love the number theory. Uh, you know, I love to play with the number theory. I can see things that it can be useful for. Um, and uh, so if there's sort of a plan that we want to, at the time we were working on, how to play mental poker, okay? Yes. So that was kind of the example that we started Generating. with. So there was a poke, how to play mental poker protocol that Rivest Shamir and Adelman had a paper on. Well, there was. There was, yeah. But uh, when we read this paper, it's clear it's, uh, there's a problem with it. And the, the problem was actually pointed out by Lipton, who shows that the way that they thought about doing it is that there's partial information that's leak, leaked about cards. So you can tell from the encryption of a card. Yes. So there's sort of, you take 52 numbers, which each representing a card, and you encrypt it. Okay. And then the thing is that from these encryptions, you can tell whether maybe the, some partial information about the card, like whether it's high or low or red or black, it's not good for a poker game. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. the whole point is to be, you know, upside down, right? Um, is, so how do you, so then we think to ourselves, okay, how do we encrypt these cards so that they don't leak yes. any information about the card? And then how are you able to deal cards without actually uh, leaking any partial information? And, that, and we come up, so there's this idea of the game and then you have to formulate what it is you want about the encryption, and then you have to find actually a number theoretic implementation right. of uh, how to encrypt a card. And we come up with this idea of how do you encrypt a single bit, because it's kind of clear that if you write down the name of the card, and you, th you think about it, really writing it down in, in binary uh, as zeros and ones, you need a way to sort of encrypt a zero and a way to encrypt a one in such a way that you can't tell apart whether it's encryption of a zero or one. And now the question is, how do you do it? What is the common knowledge at the time about this kind of an inquiry? I mean, I, I, I know you... I don't think it's even formulated. It's not even formulated. No. So you're two wild and crazy kids who are just basically following your interest, uh, yeah. trying to... And again, it's broadly within the context of cryptology. I mean, yeah. it's, it's inscripting. Um, it's not called cryptology. It was really applications of computational number theory. Okay. There was a, a three papers maybe around. There's the RSA paper, there's Merkel Hellman, maybe this paper by Brossard, very few papers. Oh. And uh, this mental poker, you know, it's, it's fun, right? It's, uh, it's a fun question. There's a kind of, at the end, it turns out it distills uh, a way to encrypt zeros and ones so that you can't tell them apart, and therefore you can encrypt any message oh. in a way that hides all partial information. You have to show that these two things are equivalent. 
that if you can encrypt a zero or one, this implies you can encrypt any message in a way that doesn't leak any partial information right. about the underlying message. That's but true. at this point, none of these problems are formulated, certainly not solved. There's no reductions. There's no notion of how you reduce one to the other. Because uh -huh. what does it mean to reduce? I mean, you have to actually define that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Are you going to your common professor, Bloom, and presenting some of these ideas yeah, so and go along. Yeah, usually, I think that we worked on this particular first paper. He was away. He was actually, I think he was doing a sabbatical here. Uh, so we presented him when we're kind of done. Uh, Dick Carp is around, you know, yes. we present him some stuff and he's like asking questions. Well, what does this mean? I think he may have asked, well, what does it mean about partial information? So we asked the question, then we realize we need to prove something. Ah. What can we prove? And then we do. That's the perfect professorial connection when they just ask the right question. Of you. Yeah. Sometimes out of, just because they are, you know, they, their mind they, is, you know, they know what to ask, but without even thinking about it much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you do, in fact, come up with a satisfactory solution yes. to, um, and you write a paper as a result. We write a paper. We send it to a conference. Yes. Uh, in fact, the paper is called "How to Play Mental Poker and and Hide a One Bit" or something like this. I don't remember how. It, in uh, encryption, hiding all partial information or something of the sort, and uh, emphasizing more the mental poker. Even though, in retrospect, who cares? Nobody's yeah, yeah, going to yeah. use it for that. Uh, and it gets in. So it's 80... 80... What is it? 80. 81? 82? 82. 82. Yeah. Um, so you throw this... It's after about a year, two years of, or a year and a half of PhD uh, without a result for me. Uh, maybe it's after two years. So it's very anxiety, just for the students in the, in the, <laughs> who are watching yeah, yeah, yeah. this. Uh, I'm trying lots of things. Um, or at least I'm... I think I'm trying, but this is the thing I, I like, right? And then this idea comes up yes. about how to encrypt a single bit using this problem called quadratic residues, whatever, distinguishing quadratic residues from non-residues, which is sort of a decision question. Is it a residue or non-residue? So if it's a residue, it's a zero. If it's a non-residue, it's a one. That's how we encrypt zeros and ones. Um, and uh, But when you solve it, and it's clearly a new and good idea, yes. then you're set. Right? You're going to have a PhD. Um, I'm going to have a PhD. Do they say congratulations to your PhD or do you have to reformulate this in a dissertation? No, no. You, you know, paper gets in and Manuel's thing was that he said that if you have a few results or even one, either one big result or three yes. papers, which are not necessarily um, substantial, you have a PhD. So this is, this is, this is substantial. Got it. Um, are there Hosannas around the world when this is this paper is sent out. How is it received? What do you, you say? The concept. Oh, uh, oh, how is it received? How is it received? It's accepted. You know, it's a small community then. The Fox Talk, you know, okay. Foundation of Computer Science type uh, papers, theory, the main theory conferences still today. Um, I gave the talk in San Francisco. Uh, people liked it. It's interesting. I think we continue. In the sense is that we say, okay, so are there other ways to encrypt a single bit that are, don't have to do with this quadratic residue problem? What does it mean? Yes. Uh, a Rivest, who is a professor at MIT, you know, of course he's interested. There's this conference called Crypto, which is, you know, I was at the first conference. I think mm -hmm. it's in '81, um, and those people are interested. So it's only in retrospect, really, that. The the field the grows. I mean, world sees right. No, the but there's also a, a body of things. If it just stopped in one paper, but then you know we write more papers. There's this zero knowledge. You know, there's protocols. It becomes a whole field. Okay, mm -hmm. let's get to zero knowledge. Okay, um, that's the next stage. Right. And again, a collaborative. The collaboration continues. The yeah, yeah. So uh, Sylvia goes to Toronto, and he's uh, and I come here as a postdoc. Then eventually, he, we both become faculty members here, and. Um, we're working on this zero knowledge paper, but we don't call it zero knowledge at that point. Oh. It has many names. It has participatory proofs, proofs with minimum knowledge. You know, why there are there so many versions of this paper is because uh, uh, yeah, we keep submitting, it keeps getting rejected. I think maybe six times, five times. Really? And then Rakoff also uh, joins us um, and uh, we approve the paper. Eventually it's called the knowledge complexity of interactive proofs. Before we get to success, yeah. let's talk about, not failure, but 
postponement of the realization <laughs> that it's doing something. Yeah. Okay. So why does it get rejected? Do you get responses about? It's very new. It, it, it really it's a it's a new model of a proof. Yes. You know, proofs in mathematical are uh, accepted things, right? You have a, a statement, and you have axioms, and you have derivations, then you have QED, right? Um, here we're talking about uh, a protocol yes. where there is sort of someone who's designated a prover, someone who's actually checking the proof, and they go back and forth interacting, where um, the idea is that the verify, you can think of it as someone is asking questions, the prover supplies answers, the questions are a result of a, to of a coin toss, um, so these are randomized proofs, and uh, there's some probability that uh, the verifier who's checking the proof will agree yes. that the theorem is correct when it isn't. Um, it's a very different concept than what mathematical proofs are supposed to be. I only like, press this because the, the idea of resistance to oh, ideas yeah. That's still in, true. inside is, yes, so just that climate of, which sometimes can be productive because you have to then convince the naysayers. Absolutely. And, and that can focus your, your right. work. Makes the work better. But the, uh, the extent of naysaying is mm -hmm. often not understood broadly, how much you really have to fight for an idea because it's a radical new idea. Absolutely. I think that that's, uh, I have found it to be the true, the case, uh, not only in the beginning, but even till now. So and even, I, even I, intelligent I, people are stupid. In the face of uh, well, what's intelligent, you know, the uh, question is what's know. intelligent. I think that there are people who are much more willing to accept original ideas, and some people who are very intelligent in many yes. ways that are not. Yes, I think it's more conservative versus not conservative. I don't think it has much to do with intelligence. Okay, so um, eventually you do get it published. Yes, and, and again, just in a brief summary, what does it? What is the uh, question it answers? Broadly. I mean, okay. you've begun to say that. But. So the question it answers is um, the following. A, usually in mathematics, okay, when you talk about a proof, classically in mathematics when you talk about a proof, is once you have the proof, you can also transfer it, right? I mean, yes. somebody gave you a proof, then it exists, it's, and then you can tell it to others. Let's think of right. it this way. Uh, in this, in this um, interactive proof, uh, since the process is interactive, uh, you cannot trans... And let's say I'm the prover, I know classical proof. But the way that I convince you of, of the correctness of a statement is through this interaction, at the end of which you are convinced with high probability that there exists a proof and the theorem is correct. But how do you transfer it to a second party? You don't necessarily... Can, you can't necessarily transfer it. Now, what does that mean? It means two things. One is, possibly I can prove to you things which are much harder than I could have before. Why do I say that? Because it could be that if I wanted to prove it to you classically, it would be extremely long proof, maybe exponential in size. Yes. But if you're willing to give up some small probability of being correct, so you're willing to accept a l very, very little probability of, that I might be cheating you, yes. then I could convince you more fast, faster, which means that I can convince you of much harder statements, which wow. would require classically very long proofs in a short amount of time, that's one. So it answers the fact that you have come up with a new mechanism which can produce much shorter proofs. And two, it means that now we've decoupled the concept of a theory, of, um, of correctness, of a checking correctness with knowing how to prove it. Right. So that means that I am able to convince you that something is correct without actually giving you the ability of convincing someone else that it's correct. And if you take this to the extreme, we get yeah. something called zero knowledge. So in other words, you know it's correct, but other than that, you've gotten zero knowledge of the proof. Okay. So if you want to connect it to applications, yes. or, you know, let's say I'm trying to convince you that I know the solution to some problem, because that's what identifies me. So if we think about identification, so let's say that I'm associated with some hard problem that only I know how to solve. It could be a factorization of a composite number, which is hard to factor. I know it. How do I know it? Maybe I took two primes, I multiplied it, and that's the composite number associated with Shafi. And you now want to and I want to convince you now, because you are a computer or something, that I know how to factor this number. But I don't want to tell you the factorization, because then you're going to know how to factor it. And if, if I do it over the internet, anybody watching it will know how to factor. So how do I convince you that I know the factorization without you figuring out the factorization or anything about right. factorization more than you knew before we started this convincing? Right. So uh, we can do that now. You can do that now. Because it's a zero-knowledge proof. What? 
what are the implications of... So I just want to say something that I've yes. said two things. One right. is zero-knowledge proofs, which is I, I prove to you that a theorem is correct, okay? And another thing is that I prove to you that I know how to prove it. So proving my identity is uh, uh, the second kind, but these two notions are very tied to each other. Okay. Okay. Again, what, what has been achieved in the broader world as a result of this insight? So that's very interesting. So the idea of proving your identity was very quickly, um, people made the connection between zero knowledge proofs or zero knowledge proofs of knowledge uh, and proving identity. And this Adi Shamir no, uh, realized that it would be good for proving identity and he went on to do also a company with Murdoch or, or to be at least a, the, this idea of proving identity and zero knowledge is a big foundation of that uh, company, the foundational technology. Um, you can do a lot more than that. You can prove a uh, relationship between um, a statements. So what do I mean by that? For example, suppose you encrypted uh, a value x. I'm going to describe it as mathematics, then we'll talk about application. Yes, yes. Suppose there's an encryption of value x and there's an encryption of value y, and I know what x and y are, maybe I encrypted them, and I want to prove to you that x and y are the same. Or I want to prove to you that x and y are different. Or I want to prove to you that x is bigger than y, or x is less than y, and so forth. Any kind of function that depends both on x and y, without telling you what x and y are. So I want you to know that the statement I'm claiming is true, and nothing else. Yes. Zero knowledge. So we can do anything, okay? Because there's uh, subsequent papers that show not show that any theorem can be done this way, okay? Um, so now it's the, it's the very nature of proof itself, which is being now. Right, but in terms of but in terms of application, what it means now is that um, it means the following. Uh, so I'm going to use I'm going to fast forward 35 years or 40 years or something, and let's talk about what's happening today. So today, a lot of people are talking about blockchain technology. You know, these public ledgers, the bitcoins. Maybe you've heard of these yes. terms. And uh, all of a sudden, the the idea of zero knowledge has uh, captivated people's attention again. So we're talking many, many years later. Why? Because they're saying, suppose that in, a, in the near future, maybe even today, you will be able to post um, uh, transactions or you'll be able to encrypt things, events that have happened. Event might be that you've paid someone some money, that you may have signed a contract, that you may have serviced um, your automobile in a, car, in a, in a shop, these are events that happen in your daily life, things you do. Right. Um, and um, these events, let's say you want to keep record of them. Mm -hmm. And you want actually to post them sort of uh, for all to know. Uh, and there is a way to do it. Let's say via some mechanism similar to Bitcoin. Let's talk about it. As if there's, a, there's a chain or a blockchain where all these events are blocks on this chain. And some of them are posted and they are even serialized in time. And now... I actually don't want everybody to know what I'm up to. So I don't actually post it in the clear, I encrypt it. So what's posted are encryption of these things. And I have now the ability to prove to someone in the future something about all these events that happened in the past. For example, in the car servicing example, I could prove to someone who wants to buy my car that I serviced it, that I paid this much money for it, that I fixed it, or that I paid the tickets, whatever it's, and all in zero knowledge, that the value of the car still is um, above a certain value, mm -hmm. without actually having to reveal to them really what I've been up to all this time. So that's kind of a, a strange, maybe, example. If you want to talk about example about health, so there's a lot of doctors I went uh, to, maybe I got, uh, blood drawn, I got, uh, I had the flu, I took medication, I didn't take medication, all of that is on the blockchain. Right. It's all encrypted events because it's my health history. And maybe I'd like to convince the insurance company they should insure me. But I don't want them to, to know everything's going the, on. The circumstances, yes. Yeah, but there might be a monetary value or a rating associated with each one of these events. I can prove to them in zero knowledge that my rating is still above a certain. Perfect. Yeah. So the, uh, again, the, maybe I'm melodramatic, the revolutionary implications of this took some time to develop. Uh, when you're doing it, you're doing it, and again, maybe I'm being too precise in my inquiry, but you're doing it theoretically, yeah. initially. Yeah, totally. Totally. Mental poker. So, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I don't believe there's anything that can be done that will have such fundamental implications if you do it, if you know already the answer for the applications. Obviously, right? Because everybody else can do it. 
So it's fine. It could be interesting and good, but it's not going to be revolutionary. Isn't that a habit of mind that some people don't have? That they that they focus on imagine application and then try to get to that. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing that that's exactly the wrong way to proceed. No, I don't know if it's the wrong way. I just don't. I don't. It's the wrong way for you. If what you are aiming for is is to have uh, revolutionary impact, nobody aims for revolutionary impact, though. Got it. So I mean, um, you see what I'm saying? Yes. Because it otherwise, how could you aim for revolutionary impact? It doesn't make any sense. Right. I guess what I'm saying is that I believe basic research is the only way that this type of impact will come about, um, and that is the importance of you know basic research. The thing is, you have to believe it because it's really. Um, we have a saying in Hebrew, Shlach lach mechal pnei amayim. I don't know how to translate it. It's like, it's like send your bread on, on the, water. On the water. Uh, you have to have enough bread to be willing to do so. You also have to convince um, resource, sources of, re, of, of support yeah. and maybe administrators. That's, right. That's what I meant by bread. Somebody has to have enough funds and enough trust to do so. I see. Now, at MIT you have what I can only imagine as a layman, a near-perfect community in which to pursue ideas purely. Yes. Have you found that true here? What is the, I'm actually now gonna ask, and it may be true in both cases, the climate of research, um, both here, and you're also at the Weizmann Institute. Yes, that's and, right. So the, you actually have rarely, really, two parallel universes in which you do research. Yeah. Can you characterize these two universes yeah. as a researcher? Sure. So first of all, I think that both at Weizmann and at MIT, there's a very, very strong group of for cryptography and, and complexity theory. Uh, probably there's more focus on complexity theory at Weizmann uh, and maybe more focus on applications at MIT, but both places are like the world, the best in the world, in my opinion. Yes. Um, so the incredibly rich environments. The MIT environment, we have a lot of incredibly strong graduate students, postdocs, you know, it's a very um, intense mm -hmm. environment, which means that there's sort of more seminars that you could actually physically attend, even if you wanted to attend everything. Mm -hmm. uh, their classes, um, the number of graduate students is very large. Right now I have eight graduate students and my colleague has eight, you know, it's, it's the lot. brain power is fabulous. There's also uh, a lot of graduate students. It's a lot of graduate students. I didn't always have so many, so wow. this has happened over the years. Uh, this is good. Uh, this also means that a particular type of atmosphere has to fit you. You know, you have to feel um, comfortable in, in such an intense environment. Uh, in Weizmann, it's a, the faculty is fantastic, the graduate students also, but the numbers are smaller. Mm. The intensity is small, which means it gives you a little bit more time on the task. And at the other, on the other hand, it's not as, you know, um, dynamic. But uh, there's definitely pluses. So those are different environments. For me, I think it's been good. You know, the time that I was at Weizmann, I got an actually important work done. Uh, there's always a little bit of a, you miss a little bit, the excitement. Um, of MIT. Of MIT. In Weizmann, yes. Yeah. yes. And at, at MIT, you miss the peace <laughs> yeah. of Weizmann. Um, it's an assumption rather than something uh, that is necessarily true in my mm -hmm. part that Weizmann also, it's not that it's in a small country, that's not the relevant yeah. thing, but that the, uh, the nature of the faculty and even the students is more uh, national rather than international. And I could be wrong about that. No, I, mean, I people think People come from everywhere and no, Weizmann as no, well. No, I think that, um, you know, actually the Weizmann, uh, department, the computer science department, there were like, you know, Adi Shamir is there and Amir Pnueli and I, there was like three Turing Award winners there. So it's and, quite international. No, but they're always rallies. So so uh, it's very strong, okay. but it's yeah. true that they're always rallies. Now every once in a while, we have postdocs from abroad. They often don't come from North America, although they should really. And I think that they actually even know it. But, um, you know, when you're a postdoc, say, and you have to make a decision where to take a postdoc, you might think that staying sort of in your in the states uh, is better idea, but people right. come in the summer. Their work, their their workshops that we okay. run in Weizmann. Uh, Israel is a really strong uh, player in the theory of, com of of computer science. 
No, know? famously, actually. Very so. Yeah, Very yeah. much so. No, I'm not saying that it's it's. A, it's and also a in robotics, lesser. vision. There's ser- several subfields where the computer science story is, is, is very strong in Israel. But the, uh, again, uh, not to pursue it, just this whole question of an international gathering place, which MIT seems to be, yeah. must be, it's offer its own kind of excitement. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the people are from everywhere, from all over the world, you know, from Europe, from India, from China, I mean, it's right. uh, from Asia, from Middle East, so absolutely. It's a resource for and of the world. Yep. Um, where is your research taking you these days? Where is my research taking me? <laughs> so it's sort of in two parallel tracks. One is really, um, it's sort of in contrast with what we spoke of before. <laughs> one is that all these theories that one came up with uh, years ago, some of them more recently, uh, on encryption, on multi-party computation, so that has m- many parties computing together on private inputs, seem to have hit the application phase in the sense that there are areas in science, like medicine, biology, there are areas in finance, where people are recognizing the applicability of cryptography. And of these particular techniques, not just encrypting and digital signing, but protocols, zero knowledge proofs, you know, blockchains and so forth. And um, it's sort of time to kind of take your knowledge and see if it is applicable to a particular setting. So, and you're doing that? Yes. I, so I am interested in it and I am uh, actively engaged in it. Okay. That's one. And two is that I'm pursuing some interest in complexity theory, mm-hmm. which have nothing to do with cryptography, um, that have to do with the randomness and um, things called pseudo-deterministic algorithms. And uh, that's, I find... That's the theorist in you, the, the, yeah, that's the, sort the of, pure researcher. That's sort of the intellectual curiosity. You know, it's just that it's appealing to me and I, and I, and I love it. And, Right. I find it fascinating. Do you find that, that your graduate students are pretty much coming in these two directions yeah. with you, or do they tend to be more around one of your sides? Uh, no, then I think each one has their own uh, interest. Mm-hmm. So they, some people are interested in complexity theory, some people in cryptography, and uh, not even applied cryptography, because there's a lot of work being done in theory of cryptography. Yes. Um, and. Uh, each student is doing their own thing. In fact, there's now a lot of interest in privacy from a policy point of view, and I have some students who are interested in that. Uh, by policy, I mean, you know, there, there's these debates. When you have encryption, uh, how much privilege does the government have? Let's say that there's a court order they want to see, have access to encrypted yes, data. Yes, uh, should they have it? Shouldn't they have it? Um, so there are a lot of policy questions that are coming up with more and more of this technology use mm-hmm. in the world, and I have some students who are interested in that. There's some question about how cryptography and machine learning are going to be interacting in the future. So I have some work on that. I have some students who are interested in it. In the process, in the relationship between the professor and the student, um, do they sometimes lead and you follow? So first of all, um, I'm very much in the model of Manuel Blum, that um, they do their own projects. I think that my philosophy so far has been is um, that in the beginning years, you know, before a student writes a paper, uh, I'm much more involved. So proposing the project, meeting regularly, coming up with um, a question, helping with the solution. Uh, But once they have a first paper, I don't think they need me. At least that was my experience. Well, exactly. And this would replicate exactly how you were able to achieve. Yeah, but and but and I th- and they work together, and I'm very much, I ve- I encourage that very much, that they would work with each other rather than with uh, faculty members. Not every advisor feels this way, but I think that that's probably the best outcome. And when we do work together, um, you asked, could it be that they lead? I think past the question, here is a question, here is some interesting problem that would be worth reading, and working on, and here possible idea why. There is a solution, right. very much so. You know that you know it's, they're doing a lot of the work. So if past the que- setting the question and maybe setting the direction, having some intuition on a solution, it's theirs to to go with. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I have a problem. I'm working on it all these years, and now can you solve this sub problem? Can you solve that sub problem? Right. No. It's not like that. No. I think that's the last word. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure.